Let me open the notes. Oh, so much pollen. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so this section's on processing raw text because you can't essentially do anything else until you know how to clean up text. Text is messy, messy, messy. How do we clean it up? What is the worst thing that we can have and what, how do we deal with it? Okay. Personally, I think Twitter is some of the messiest data that you can have, mostly because depending on the type of text that you are dealing with, you might end up with a lot of madness. Okay. So we're going to start um, by talking about how do we work with strings, because text is just a string. I will talk about like the, the ways that you can clean up strings. In this lecture, I'm going to switch back and forth between R and Python. Okay. So here, um, at the top of each chunk, it's going to tell you if it's an R chunk or a Python chunk. And I'm going to use that to compare and contrast. So in R, you do it like this. In Python, you do it like that. In most of our other lectures, we're going to actually be mostly Python. So we'll start with R and then show you Python and kind of keep them separate. But in this lecture, we're going to go back and forth. Okay, so just pay attention to what kind of chunk it is. Um, so you have a text analytics book. Okay. Is this chapter three? I don't know. I don't really know. Do remember these things? Uh, yes. 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 Not completely. A lot of it, yes. <laughs> tokenizers. Tokenizers. Chapter 3 also, I think, has um, kind of stimming, contractions. Yes. Spelling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I would say the first half of Chapter 3. So there's a section. It ends with uh let's see here spacey stuff um and then there's it like a 163 if we have the same book it switches to part of speech tagging that is in a couple weeks so chapter three is like this like super huge chapter that covers um actually several things so the second half of it is um a different week but the first half is this week yes but this book only has Python, so we are also adding the R part to it. So the answer is yes. Yes and no. Perfect. All right. So language data is just a bunch of strings. Right, so we're just dealing with a whole bunch of text. What can we do with it? Strings in Python and R are character vectors. Now in R, it calls it CHR for character, but that means string. Now in Python, it's usually considered a string, which is STR, but they're the same kind of object. And these come in a lot of shapes and sizes, which is good and bad, right? So we'll learn how to work with them either in tokenized form in like a list or in like just full text form. And I think over the semesters, I've learned some new tricks and stuff. So as we go, I might stop and say, you know what? I've found an easier way to do this and update the notes right now. Okay. I think I'm thinking of one spot in particular. I have found a much easier way to do it. Um, and we'll add that in so that you guys are getting the benefit of me ta having taught this several times now. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is just load reticulate. Okay. This is the section where we'll use a bunch of different packages, but Having said that, we'll use them all semester, okay. at least the Python ones. Okay. So I've got Reticulate loaded. I got my Anaconda distribution, which is um, the larger version of Miniconda. Okay. And if I click, I'm going to move on. All right. So I'm just going to give you some like basic ideas of how things run in the background for both of these. So this is a little bit of a tutorial too on Python and R. Okay. And so let's say we have. Two strings, Swiss and cheese, because I love cheese examples. So I've got this R chunk here at the top. If I want to combine those, there's several ways to think about combining. I could concatenate them with the C function here, which is a, um, a way to combine them into a vector. 
So in R, those are called vectors. It's like one column of data. Now that does not actually combine the words into one string. That just combines them into one object. If instead I wanted it in one string, I could use paste or paste zero. So I'd say, hey, paste together string one and string two, separate them with a space. Okay. So now it is one object, okay. one, um, it's a vector with one item in it that says Swiss cheese. Now to contrast that here in Python, we could, <clears throat> excuse me, add them together concatenate them into one string like paste by literally using the add operator. And so that's one thing I like about, about this is because that's sort of intuitively pleasing, right? So add them together. Or we can use the join function. And so the join function allows us to apply this across many objects quickly. And so I'm not sure if I have join in here. So that'll be one thing that like, let's add that right now. So we've, oh, that's the end of the notes. Let's not go there yet. All right, so we're here. And we could just literally add them together like this. And I'll make this just a little bit bigger for us. Okay. Or we can use the join operator. So the nice thing about the join operator is it allows us to, um, to combine many things in like an entire list. Okay, so let's say we have a, a giant set of vec a vector of a lot of strings, and we want to paste them all together. So I don't want to do like string one plus string two plus string three plus string four. Instead, I want to say like everything in this list combine it together. Join is much faster. Okay. I don't live code a lot because of that exact problem. It's my spelling. Okay, so I have joined. Let's paste this. Go ahead and print this output. So you can see here the space here means paste them together with a space. So here's what you join by. Join is the function, and then you put in usually a list. Okay. So I have a list of all of my strings. Practically what that means later in this set of notes and later in the semester is that we have a, a like essentially a data frame of a bunch of data, a bunch of um, strings that we want to combine. And so it's a column of data. We could say, hey, join together everything in this column. And this works like paste in R, where you just like stick it all together into one giant text piece. That's very useful. Okay. And you'll see us use join a lot in the semester. Okay. So, back up here. And I'll update these notes uh, at the end of the lecture. Now, I think indexing is a super important to think to understand in R versus Python. Okay, so indexing is like subsetting or knowing where something is. Okay. So we have data pieces that are stored in our vector or our um, data frame, whatever you want to list, whatever we're using. And indexing is knowing how to call one of them. So how do I get the third object out of my list, of my row, of my data frame, whatever? Okay. So indexing is, a, is where we are saying, hey, I want just this piece. R is a one, one index language, meaning the first object is number one. Uh, so with uh, our strings that we've been working with, string number one, if you put it in square brackets here and say, give me the one, it pulls the first item. Well, there's only one item to pull, and it's the word Swiss. Let's say in our set of strings here, we have four words. So this is a vector in R with four items in it. The second item is number one, number two. So we get cheese back. Watch what happens if you do a negative two. In R, the negative means drop. Okay, so we get Swiss is great. Okay, so it dropped the second item. And I use this a lot when I do data frames, when I do data cleaning. I'm like, hey, don't include the participant column. Okay. Instead, run all of my data set, you know, run all of my data cleaning on columns two through eight. Okay, that kind of thing. Okay. In contrast, Python is a zero index language. That pretty much doesn't work that way at all. Okay. To me, this was one of the the biggest things that I had to like wrap my head around 
when I was learning computing about zero languages versus one languages. And um, I would say R is kind of the weird one out here. So no matter what, it treats objects as a whole. So to get a specific character, I have to use a separate function in R, get a substring function. In Python, it treats objects um, as subsetable. So string here, number one, gives me the second letter, which is the letter W. Because Python is a zero index language, the first letter is zero. So the S in Swiss is the zeroth character, so it's number one. Um, the second one, the second letter, W, is the first character, and on, because okay, my spelling is terrible. And the idea behind that is that uh, you're thinking about the number of steps you have to take. So I've heard this as referred to as like if you think about this, if you've been to Europe or maybe other, um, I'm not sure about, um, I know they do this in Europe. I'm not sure about other places because I have not had the opportunity to get there. But uh, the first floor, right, the main floor is level zero. Right? The, and then the next floor up, which I would call the second floor, being American, is level one. Okay? And then like a basement would be ne level negative one. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Like the one you enter off of the, the street or whatever is the zero floor. You have not changed floors. Okay? So that's the first item. Okay? And you can either go up or go back. In the US, we call everything the first floor. Right? Um, and then if we have basements, they're like lower levels or something. We give them special names. Uh, so anyway, so that's kind of how people tell you to, to remember for Python. That zero means first. Um, so the zeroth character is the S. The oneth character is the W. So here, this does not work the same at all. If, if you have one string, it breaks it down by character. If you use the negative one, this is not maybe obvious based on the fact that Swiss starts and begins with an S, but that's actually the, the last object. Okay. So if I can show you, right, let me, maybe here, where is it? Yeah, working directories. Let's take string two. Okay. String two. I guess, okay, it's cheese. So let's see, what do we get if we do string two, negative one? Okay. If this were R, you would think, well, maybe it's going to drop the H because it's zero and then one, but nope, it just gives you the last character. Okay. So the negative just means count from the end back. So an R negative means drops, and Python means count from backwards from the end. If I have a list, okay, so first thing you have to learn is in R, these are called vectors. In Python, these square brackets are called lists. Okay. Lists in R are very strange objects. They're very strange. But um, in Python, we can do a similar type of thing where we have like these weird different sized objects where like the first item in a list in R is, you know, like four character, four items, and then the third one is 15 items. Lists are very handy for saving um, results from a statistical output because you, they're different links. Okay. Uh, Python is a similar structure with a list where we can have different embedded kind of structures. So we can have lists and lists. And as we go throughout this semester, you'll see how that's handy, hopefully, where we have lists embedded in other objects. Okay, to only introduce one concept at a time here. Um, so the little square brackets are, are called a list. I think of lists in Python like vectors in R, although they can be much more than that. But right now that helps you make sense. It's a, a set of like a, one, a single row of, of items. So if I pick the zeroth item, I get Swiss back now. So if there are multiple objects, it breaks them down by object. If there's one object, it breaks it down by character. And then the same thing here, the negative one means count from the end. So this is one of those things that I think if you're, uh, you've been using R for a long time, this is a lot of like, wait, why? Okay. And there are definitely days where I'm like, oh, zero. Okay. 
<clears throat> so let me throw a wrinkle into that even more is slicing. Okay. So let's see this comment first. So when I started learning R, I thought R vectors looked like a Python list. Yes, they're very similar. Um, except that, you know, an R of vector is essentially one set of objects. You can't like nest them. So you can't have like one set of two and one set of three. You know, you just have one set, right? It's essentially like one row of data. In Python, based on how you do this, you can have lists in lists. So I can have a list of four lists, and they can be different sizes. So the R list object really is like Python's list object. Um, it's just very confusing at first if you tell people this. <laughs> so it's easier to think like a list is a row of data. Like I think that's a good place to start, even though it's not really totally accurate, um, because that will hopefully help you map from one to another. That helped me, and then later I figured out I wasn't that wasn't quite right. Um, okay, so let's talk about slicing. Slicing, personally, in Python is the worst. I think it is super confusing. So, um, in in R first, a slice works like uh, counting the objects that you want. So remember our set of strings variable here is Swiss cheese is awesome or Swiss cheese is great. And if I want, if I say here I want one colon two, what that does is it gives me one through two which is the first two objects in R. I can't leave one of the colon sides blank. Right, so I can't say uh, space colon two. It doesn't let me do that. Okay. Now I use this in R like literally every time I have it open, I like to use column references by their numbers instead of by their names because numbers are faster. So all the time I'm like, hey, give me columns 15 through 35. Um, I find that very handy. When I get in trouble is when I switch back to Python. Okay, so here's the full object, a okay, set of string. Now let's say I want to say, okay, well give me zero to one, because if I wanted one to two before, it makes sense, so I just have to subtract one, because this is a zero language. Like, give me zero to one instead. And then it gives you one object back, and you're like, what the heck, man? Right? So the colon operator in Python instead works as up to, but not including. And I know PyCharm covers this, so hopefully you'll get through kind of some indexing and some, uh, slicing sections. So uh, this to really will, confuses me a lot. So it gives you zero up to one, but not including one. So if I did 0 colon 2, I would get 0 up to 2, but not including 2, and that would match Swiss cheese from above. However, here I can leave the front part or the back part blank. Uh, yes, exactly. That's actually a great, great way to explain it. Um, less than or equal to, and then um, or just less than. That's a, that's a great example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can leave it blank. If you leave it blank, it assumes that means zero. Okay. Uh, or you can leave the end blank. Now this is handy. Okay, I do like this function. So it's two up to the end. So two meaning zero, one, two, up to and including the end. So this is giving me all the way through to the, to the very end if you leave it blank. <clears throat> So I might actually put that less than or equal to thing in there. Let's just, I'm going to leave myself a little note. I think that's a great example. I'll add that in there as a note. Okay, so that's just kind of like your very basic overview of some of the conceptual differences that we're going to use. Now let's get into um, actually manipulating the string itself. Okay, so that's just your kind of like brief vectors versus lists kind of thing. And I'm going to slowly try to add more of this. Now this lecture I think is going to seem like a lot of different functions at once and a lot of code. I promise you it slows down. Okay, so this is the, the set where it's like, why is there so much stuff? 
um, it will definitely slow down from here because we're going to use this code again across multiple lectures. So our goal is to clean up the text. Text is messy. What can I do? And this is not necessarily the order I would do it in. I have the order I would do it in as the assignment. We're just going to kind of work through some different um, examples here. And that's why I have that um, raw text, text example in the order that's in the same order as the assignment. Because I know I really like to put the assignments in the same order as the notes. But in this case, um, it kind of goes back and forth a little bit based on uh, the section we're on. Uh, and so the first thing you should do is spell check, but I don't want to put that right at the front because that's a lot of code. So let's start simpler than that. How do we lowercase a string? Okay. So one problem is prior casing. So people write in upper and lowercase. Sometimes people write in what we used to like um, call uh, that like mixed case that you would write in when you're a teenager. I don't know if that was just a distinctly American thing or not. Um, Camel case, yes. Is that what it's called? I didn't ever have a name for that. That's excellent. I'm gonna hold on to that in my head. But you know, typos, up, some people just doing it for fun, to make it look cute, whatever. So my, my general suggestion to folks is to lowercase everything, because then it's consistent. I guess you could uppercase everything, but I don't, I don't know, it's easier to read in lowercase. So, <clears throat> What I can do to make this one string, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this from a, uh, a vector in R of objects to one giant string. Okay, it's going to be my sentence. And that's going to be handy because essentially what happens is that we often, instead of starting with a set of objects, we have one giant string. So when you read stuff from the internet, which I'll show you how to do here in a minute, you just get like one string back. Okay. So we're going to have to work with objects that are a bunch of words at once. So all I've done here is combine it into one sentence. Okay. All right. The to upper function will upper, uh, uppercase everything. Okay. This is R. The to lower function will lowercase everything, so very useful. The string R package is the shiznit. I love this package, string R and string I. I think they probably both do a lot of the same things. There's just some that I like in one and some that I like in the other, but they're both great package, text manipulation packages. So str to upper is the uppercase one. str to lower is lowercase, but string R has more options. So title case, where every individual word is capitalized, that's based on spaces. Okay, so this, this works well for English, does not work well for, for languages where um, there's no spaces between words. Okay. Uh, I think, is it part of Pettyverse, string R? Uh, maybe. I'll see. We have the internet, right? Yeah, cool. Is string I the one that's not? <laughs> it's just the fight between base R and, and tidyverse. Uh, either way, it also does a lot of regular expressions, which we'll get to in a little bit. So I don't love all of tidyverse, but there, it has its moments, its beautiful moments. Right? Okay, where was that? Title case, okay. and then sentence case. Sentence case is where the first letter of each sentence is capitalized, and that's often based on periods. So this is actually, these two here are touching on a point that we're going to make a little bit later about tokenization. How do we know where words start and stop? And how do we know where sentences start and stop? Okay. And for us, that's going to mean um, spaces and periods in English. Anyway. All right. So here's another example of the join function. I could say, well, our separator is a space. So I'm going to join together my strings. So I've got join a little bit later in the lecture here. Now, <clears throat> another big distinction between R and Python is that what you do in R is you have some sort of function, okay, and then you put in arguments. Right? So let's say you're trying to run a regression. You do LM, 
we have a formula argument and data argument, some other stuff you can put in. So each way, you know, any way it works, there's a function, parentheses, arguments, right, that you pass through. Python, not so much. This is a mix and match, and I don't have a very good rule for you about when it's inside the parentheses versus not, because it really depends on how it's written. Um, but the idea often is that you have an object, and there are certain things that you can do to that object. Right? Just like I can, I can run the summary function on almost everything. It's really great. Um, but I can't run the ANOVA function on, a, on um, let's say, a set of letters. Right? And so the idea is that objects themselves have um, abilities. So if you want to think about this, like superhero characters. <laughs> And so a, a vector, a string vector, has certain things that it can do. And so let me go back over here and make this more clear. So uh, let's run some of this stuff. Sentence is not defined. Oh, because I haven't defined set of strings. Okay, fine. I've been writing PHP all week, so I'm like, oh, semicolon, oh, wait, no, Python, okay, here we go, so let's join these together, okay, so now we have our sentence, so this is great, right, so if we start typing, and sometimes this works in the box, sometimes it doesn't, and I can't tell you why, but if you, um, if you hit the dot, and usually the tab, Usually you can see objects, uh, the options for that object. Okay. Um, I can't always get this to work in a Python chunk, okay. um, but I can get it to work over here. Okay. In the Now you need to put your homework in a Python chunk, but you can use the um, interactive interface too. So I could capitalize, I could case fold, center, ends with, find, format. So you can see here are all the functions that I can run on this string. And there's some other stuff down here. Ignore that stuff right now. Okay. So lower is a function that will lowercase the string. Okay. Now it's already in lowercase, so let's try a different one. Dot upper. Okay. And so you can just kind of play around with like, what does count do? Okay. Oh, nope, didn't like that. Requires one object. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so count doesn't work on this one. Um, in the way I'm trying to use it. Capitalize is also an option that's sentence case. Okay. And so Python works on that assumption, is that objects have specific things you can do with them. Okay. And so we'll put through a function. Okay. And that works until we start talking about um, there are ways to define functions as objects, but we'll get to that later. Okay. So I can uppercase my sentence, I can lowercase my sentence, I can capitalize, that's senten uh, sentence case. And then there's also a title case here, that's where every letter is capitalized. So there's a corresponding one from the tidyverse package to, to here. Now string R is not the only package that'll do this, it's just the one I like. Okay. Okay, what's the joke about R? The joke in R is there's not, it's not, the question isn't if you can, the question is how many different ways. Okay. So there are other, lots of ways to do these things. Now let's talk about regular expressions. So I'm so proud of myself because I have been using regular expressions for 15 years now, and I finally wrote one all on my own without looking it up, two of them all on my own the other day without looking it up. Okay. And I tell you that story because one, I'm really proud, but two, regular expressions are tough. There are a lot of rules and there's a lot of variation and it's not always the same from one language to another. So the regular expressions that I used to write in Perl, which was one of my first like real programming languages <laughs> um, that I used to write experiments um, in, and the regular expressions in Python and the regular expressions in R are all just slightly different. So that's part of the problem. The other problem is they're just like stupidly hard to write personally. So it's okay if you Google it. I encourage Googling it. Every time you need to, yeah, exactly. When when one regexes, one uses Stack Overflow. It's, it's just one of those things. I happen to remember 
it the other day and I was very proud of myself. So, um, but what is the purpose of a regex? Okay, so we're gonna call this regex, it's a regular expression. And the idea behind regular expressions is allowing you to search for a flexible set of things. Usually this is used on strings to find specific objects, right? So if you're trying to, um, let's say you're trying to fill out a form and you want to, um, you, uh, okay, so you're trying to register for a website, right? And uh, you typed in your email wrong. How does it know that your email was not correct? Like that it wasn't a valid email? Well, that's a regular expression. Okay. Um, how do you, uh, you know, how does it know that you have eight characters, one uppercase, one, <laughs> one dollar sign, whatever for a password, part of regular expression? And so they're really good at allowing us to find pieces of text that we're interested in, right? So I could say, give me all the words that end in Y. I could say, um, give me everything that's six letters that has a T as the third letter and an o, um, R as a sixth letter. I mean, it's just super flexible, okay? That flexibility also <laughs> makes it very difficult to just like totally remember all of it off the top of your head. Uh, there's a lot of trial and error. And for me, my problem is that I remember just enough to be dangerous that I know, I'm like, okay, I know the slash D, is this double slash D because it's Python? Like, so I usually Google it. Uh, regular expression for everything but punctuation. I mean, like I have Googled all of it before. So, um, don't be like upset if these you find these frustrating, I guess is what I would say is because I find them frustrating and I've been using them for a long time. Okay. Um, and I don't mean to make that sound like it's going to be impossible. I'm just saying like they're not something that you just like, oh, yeah, I got it. If you do, great. Tell me how to do it. Okay. So we're mostly going to use string R for regular expressions because it's great. Okay. Uh, they have a whole website on this. Uh, and one reason I like string R for it is because it's made them a little bit easier, but that means it's also a little bit different than everything else. Okay. Um, there are some great base R functions. If you're like base R for life, right? Uh, which is grep and G sub. Uh, I use grep a lot. Okay. G sub is a substituting one. So, you know, I kind of flip back and forth on which one I'm going to use that day because it's like, all right, grep, find all the T's. Um, but I think string R is based on a lot of grep underneath. So what are some of the rules? Okay, a dot, a dot matches a single character. So if you're actually wanting to find periods, you have to tell it something special to say, no, but really I just want the period. Okay. So all of these special characters can be escaped is what it's called to find um, that exact character. But generally, dots are used to find a single, char a single character of any form, of any shape. Okay. So a single character could match a single space, it could match a single comma, it could match um, one T, but it's any single character. A caret, the caret on my QWERTY keyboard is above the six, okay. means that it's something that has to start at the beginning of a string. So that if caret M, that would be, um, the first letter of the string has to be an M. The dollar sign is for the end. So if I did R dollar sign, that would mean the character, ha the string has to end in R for me to find it. The star matches zero or more cases. And that's such a strange thing to think about. But this is when you're like, maybe it has this letter, maybe it has six of this letter. Don't know. So if I said, hey, find all the B star, it would find everything without a B and everything with one or a million Bs. Okay. So um, star sometimes is, is, you have to be careful with it because <laughs> in some of them it's a wild card key okay. and it's really actually useful for, um, for finding like this could end in Y or not, or people could be writing in that, like, you know, where they write, like, finally, and they write it like, eight Ys. Okay, how do we deal with that? Question mark will match zero or one. 
for previous characters. I don't use question marks a whole lot. I use either stars or what's the last one, the plus icon, which is one or more. Okay. So star is zero or more. Question marks is zero or one. Okay. Pluses are one or more. Uh, I personally, like I said, I don't use question marks just a whole lot. In very specific instances, I'm mostly using either uh, you know, zero or more of these, or the plus icon is really useful, one or more of these. All right, but if you did dot star, you would get everything because it's a single character or more of them. So that would be, I guess, the most flexible thing you could look for. I guess you could just do stars, but I think you have to do dot star. I can't totally remember. A couple more. The pipe is above the enter key, shift above the enter key. It's the or operator, find this or that. Uh, square brackets in regular expression finds anything in the bracket. So if I did square brackets AEIOU, that's a way to find any vowel. It's a ret return this object if any of these vowels are found. Um, so square brackets with a Carrot at the front matches anything not present, so I could say find any consonant. So these are opposites of each other. Um, slash D uh, is any decimal digit, okay, so zero through nine. Uh, sometimes slash D also can be any um, any character. It depends on which language you're using. So big D is any nine digits. Okay, so this would be alphanumeric. Okay. Slash S is any white space character like spaces. Okay. And these are the general rules. These are not perfect across all the different forms of regular expressions, like I said. Um, and big, space, big S space is any non-white space character. Okay. Some languages also use slash T for tab, slash N for new line, or slash R for return. So it just kind of depends. And then slash W is any alphanumeric character, okay, which would be A through Z and zero through nine. Uh, and then big W is anything non-alphanumeric. <laughs> All right. So let's see if we can just find some stuff. So let's see here. Uh, I got this sentence here. We can talk about numbers, like how great is the number five, because it's my favorite number. Or what is a question mark doing in this sentence? Okay, this is just a ridiculous sentence that I came up with for an example. Okay. The function in string r is string extract. Okay, there's two. There's string extract, string extract all, and then um, string detect and string replace. We'll come back to it in a second. Okay. So string extract. Okay. What you do is you tell it what pattern you want to find. Okay. So I could tell it to find me the literal number five. And it will return the first instance that it found. And so uh, it found the number five and said, hey, here's your five. Okay, first instance only. So if I had two number fives, it would ignore the second one. So it basically runs until it finds what it's looking for and then it stops. Uh, I could also do this with double slash D. Now this is what I was talking about. It's, it's a double slash because in R you have to escape your slashes. It's annoying. So this is this is what I mean by like the, the the code says I could just use slash or D, but because we're doing this in R, this one requires two slashes. Okay. Um, using tidyverse. Okay. Other times you don't have to use two slashes. So this is why it's also hard to remember, you know, write these just off the top of your head because uh, it depends on which flavor of regular expressions. So like Markdown has different versions. Okay. They're mostly the same. But not always regular expressions are the same way. So a double slash D finds a digit, so it found that number five and it quit. Now the question mark is a, is a special character, remember? So here I've got the double slash to mean find any question mark. Notice I switched to string extract all. Find all the question marks in this sentence. And it goes, yeah, here's two of them. Now this is useful if you want to count how many times something occurs. Okay. So that's what I usually use string extract all for. Like how many times does this thing have 
whatever pattern I'm interested in. Um, the second one can find any digit, not just the occurrence of five. Correct. This would find any digit. This one would only find five. So if I had how great is five or seven, this one would only find the five. This one would find the five and then actually quit because it found at least one and quit. A string extract all would find both. Good question. All right, so this is find me the question mark. So this, this is a way I could just add up. Okay, it saves it as a list, which is annoying, but um, this doesn't tell me where they are. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's one issue here. So I don't know where they are in the pattern, I just know how many of them there are. Now, string detect is a true false operator for uh, in comparison to string extract. So in R, we have a lot of these functions that are either find the thing or is the thing there? So string extract says pull it out. Okay, find me that number. It's a five. String detect would be is there a number? Yes or no. And those each have their, their usefulnesses, so to speak. So is there an in in this sentence? Oh yeah, it's right here <laughs> at the very beginning. So it says true. There is an in in that sentence. Now my favorite one is string replace, and you'll see string replace make a um, a reoccurrence later in this lecture on um, spell checking. String replace all is very good for spell checking. So find all of the question marks, replace them with exclamation points. Okay, the exclamation point is not a special character, so there were no slashes necessary. Okay, question marks are a special reserve character, so to speak. Okay, so now we've got question marks. So just some examples in R. There are way more many ways to do this, just some like basic examples. Let's look at that same thing here in Python. Okay, this is the repackage. Okay, when you are installing this on your first assignment, which if you haven't done, you should finish. Uh, this is the regex package, which you imported by calling re. So let's see here. If I did re.search, uh, so I'm not doing sentence.search because that would make too much sense. It's re.search, so it's a function. What do I find? Find the find the four. Okay, there's no four in our sentence, so it says none. That's nice. <laughs> Instead of na, it's like none. <laughs> uh, so notice how this is different. Here we have sentence first, pattern second. Another kind of common thing that I see in Python is that the order of arguments is ex almost always exactly backwards. <laughs> so it's pattern first, sentence second, second. Which may be how grep works too, if I remember correctly. So find the number four. Nope, not in there. Okay, fine. Find up some sort of number at all, and it does. Okay, so it tells me that the um, this is a special type of object. Okay, it's not um, a list or a vector. It's a special matching object. Okay, here's the nice part. It tells me where it is. That's the number count. So if you wanted to find the number five, you would use slicing and you could do sentence square brackets 44 colon 45 and you would get your five back. So it does tell you where it's at, handy, and tells you what matched it. It's a five. Same thing for question marks. Okay, but notice here that it only found the first one. So to find both of them, you use a function called refindall, which kind of makes sense. But when you do find all, it doesn't tell you where they are. Can't win them all, right? All right. Find iterable is a special type of argument where I could say, okay, well, I want to know where these question marks are. So find iterable calls this um, iterator object, or like the person I took a Python course and they always called it iterator, and it made me laugh every time. Um, but an iterator object is a loopable object. I mean, I can loop over this option and print out one for each question mark here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I could print out one of these. So I would know where every one of them is. And re.sub. So 90% of the time, what we're going to use is refindall and re.sub. 
Okay, redox sub super useful because it's been essentially um, a string replace all. So what do I want to find? What do I want to replace it with? Here's my sentence to find it and replace it in. So that's the very, very small introduction to regular expressions. So we're just going to kind of slowly introduce them and show you how to use them. So what would I need to do? This is kind of a, a, a road map to the rest of this lecture. So I need to take out weird symbols in HTML tags. A lot of data that we're interested in comes from the internet. Okay, it comes from Twitter, it comes from Amazon, it comes from all these different places, and sometimes it's formatted nicely, mostly it's not. So how do I get rid of that crap? Uh, thinking about tokenization, how do I break it into individual words? Because a lot of our analyses are based on individual words. How do we remove unnecessary tokens? Uh, the crap we don't want and stop words. Like, what is a stop word? Like, what do I do with words that are stopped? We'll talk about that. Contractions, which has only recently become the bane of my existence, and I know I have an easier set of code for that section, which is going to be great for us. Uh, spelling errors, I don't have easier code for that, sorry. Uh, and then all of the things that I can do. So I could stem, I could limitize. And then those two we'll talk about in this lecture, tagging, chunking, and parsing are like other whole weeks in our class. Okay. So very briefly, stemming is when we're interested in taking off the affix. Okay. This is the regular expression way of removing affixes. So every word like stem itself would be cleaned of things like ing for, for verb, uh, for as a participle, whatever it is. Um, ing, the s for plurals, the eds for past tense. So any possible um, affix, front or end, right, just taken off right off the top. So tokens and stop words becomes tokens and stop, or token and stop word. Okay. Spelling errors becomes spell error. So you just regular expression them off. That's great up to a point because then there's a problem with the word like wings. So wings loses its S because that's plural, and then it loses its ING because that's an ING verb, and that you're left with the letter W, which is not so helpful. Um, so the solution to stemming is also meant to use limitization, okay, which is where you take a word and make it into its root word. So something like spelling becomes spell because spell is the root word for spelling. But the word morning, like it's early, stays morning because that is the root word. Okay, it doesn't become morn, which is what happens when you stem it. Tagging is for part of speech. Chunking and parsing are breaking sentences into these like tree, tree, tree diagrams of their relationship to each other. Okay, and so we'll do this as our second section, and this is our third section. And we'll talk about how to do these two way later in the notes. So basically, remember here, garbage in, garbage out. So we are, our analysis is only as clean as our data. So some brief terminology here. I think of this, so I, I've also taught in Leaf 500, and then um, I've taught that course prior to coming to this university like a thousand times. And, um, I have like this huge thing about data cleaning, right? So you have to check for your assumptions on a statistical analysis. You have to check for outliers. You have to think about missing data. I'm like very particular because your analysis is only as good as the data goes in. So much so that I don't know if you guys can see these posters on my back wall, right? They're all about like one of them says garbage in, garbage out. The other one says missing data can break the foundation. They're like World War II stats propaganda posters. I love them, right? Um, the, the whole purpose of having this lecture and having two weeks of this stuff is because that is this is essentially data cleaning for a text analysis. Okay, so when I say that people like, um, now I don't always spell check my data, it depends on the data sets, and so these rules are not hard and fast, meaning sometimes you do them, sometimes you don't, it depends on the purpose of the analysis. So if I'm 
using Twitter, I don't spell check that data, even though I know it has lots of spelling errors, but it has so many irregular things going on already that it would take me hours to figure it out, right? So without a good list of abbreviations and special lexicon words, that would be too much spell checking. Okay. For um, uh, this day, other data set that we have where we were looking at um, abstracts, scientific abstracts, we didn't spell check that one either because I would hope scientists would spell their stuff right. And they have so many special words that a, a normal spell checker would just like lose his mind. Okay. Uh, but if I'm running this on blocks, which should be normal words, hell yeah, I'm going to spell check it. <laughs> or what are we, what are we actually learning? Okay. Um, so all of these depend on the goal of the analysis, and you'll see that in the semester. We'll drop some of them and add some of them and kind of come back and forth. But you should do at least some of them for every analysis you think about. Okay. Uh, so what are they called? It can be called text preprocessing okay, or normalization of your text. And this allows us to create a standardized format for our data. And then once I have the standardized format, I can combine or compare tokens, calculate statistics on it, run topics, models, whatever I'm, I'm interested in. All right. So in particular for this example, we're going to pull um, data from the internet. So I'm going to show you just a very small bit on how to web scrape. Okay, this is not like, um, you want to learn more about web scraping, I have some stuff I, I can give you but this is a kind of quick and dirty web scraping. Because I really want to talk about how to remove HTML codes. I find these to be particularly annoying. So we, I had a student for a while who was very fascinated with, um, oh, this makes it sound like I offed the student, but he graduated. <laughs> uh, he was really interested in like news articles on different news sites that were perceptively more conservative versus more liberal, right? So Fox News perceived more conservative versus um, NPR perceived as more liberal, etc. So we learned a lot about web scraping. How do we get rid of the noise? How do we get just the text and not all that JavaScript and all that kind of stuff? And I would say Arvest is definitely the winner here. Sometimes with websites with JavaScript, you have to um, work a little bit harder than what I'm going to show you here. But in general, Arvis is pretty awesome. Okay. Also another Hadley, right? So uh, it works pretty good. So Harvest is the where the name comes from. So I'm going to show you an example here based on a blog post that I wrote about Arvest. So we're kind of like meta our best here. Um, when you do your assignment, you can use another one of my blog posts and just don't use the original one. If you must change what blog you're using, um, but you could pick a different post of mine. I don't recommend websites with a lot of crap on the side. So let me give you an example. I'm going to pick on Fox News because I can. There's a lot of like crap on the sides here and I'm not showing you um, I'm not showing you exactly how to get rid of all of that. That takes some extra work in our vest. Um, well, given the given the current time span, I bet even BBC. Let's see who's on the cover of BBC right now. Still the U.S. Okay, well maybe we won't get Trump right away, but it's still a lot of U.S. related stuff, right? Um, even though it's BBC. Um, anyways, long story short, if you wanted to do something that was a real news website, tr try to pick one. BBC would be great because there's some crap on the side, but not a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you will see a lot of this JavaScript because we're not like this lecture does not cover totally how to eliminate all that stuff. It just kind of gives you the basic idea of like here's um, somewhere to start for that. Um, would these level pages have the same level of proofreading? One would hope. <laughs> One would hope. I think sometimes with news sites, if you get something that has been posted in the last hour, you don't know. 
because the speed at which they're expected to put out this kind of data can sometimes give you um, a mess, TBH. Uh, this hopefully would be pretty good. Who knows? Um, when it comes to spell checking, I mostly do spell checking on participant data where we have them type things in boxes when we ask them questions because people can't spell even when it, it shows you that it's misspelled um, or uh, blog posts like that aren't websites, like aren't um, news sites. As long as you're not scraping the instant it happens. I don't spell check Twitter ever because it just takes too long. Okay. Um, even though I know it's super messy. Okay, anyways, back to RVS here. So, <clears throat> the way RVS works is you pull in an entire web page. Okay, so you have the URL of the place, the thing you're pulling in, so you pull that in. Okay. Use read HTML to read in that source. And then you use HTML text, which is a special function which kind of digs through the web page and finds the text. Again, this is not perfect. There are other things that you can do to help sort out. You only want the text from this part of the page, or you, you don't want all this other, it's like the comment sections and stuff like that. But um, there are some really great tutorials on RVS if you're interested in doing some web scraping. This is the like beginner's guide. <laughs> So what's in our blog? Well, this will return us one giant string that has some bad stuff in it. All these slashes um, from some schemas. So this actually looks worse than it used to. Um, but you get a lot of these like dash ins here. That's a uh, new line code. Um, you will see some some stuff here that's weirdly spelled because this is a web uh, page. Um, a uh, blog post about writing code, so it's got some stuff that's going to be misspelled, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, according to spell checker, it's not really misspelled because it's code. Right now, if I want to do that in Python, the package is requests, okay. and then the way to clean that up is called beautiful soup. Okay. So let's first talk about requests. So remember that opening a library in R is library, and then the name of the package. In Python, it's import. Okay, so I've imported requests. You do request.get to find that URL. And then you do content, blogpost.content. Now here I have only printed out a little bit of it, so I use some of that slicing we talked about earlier. You can see that it's mostly the same. So it does pull a lot of the same kind of stuff. It's got some um, JSON at the front. This is a specifically JSON code on the, the metadata for my website, that kind of idea. Um, and then it's got some actual type text out here on the side um, further, further down. All right, so how do I get rid of that? The function is beautiful soup, so the package is BS4. So from BS4, we're importing the beautiful soup function. And then it's really easy. You just do beautiful soup on our content, which is our blog page. And then I do clean content dot get text. And um, you know, this is sort of interesting because uh, you know I've run this code 10 or 12 times. And uh, I just updated, I updated my website in the last couple whatevers to one of the newer Hugo layouts. So I'm using GitHub pages and Hugo to, to make my website. And I've never seen it do so much JSON at the front. So this is something that I would have normally wanted to clean out. That beautiful soup didn't catch. And I don't think it got caught in our R section either. I got, it doesn't have it actually at the beginning here. It has a little bit. Um, you can see it here in the, the little bit. This is the JSON part. So uh, either way, it's not perfect. Both of them I would have to do something else to get rid of this stuff at the top because this is not, um, it's 
stuff I'm interested in saving. Now, uh, let's see where are we at. Let me, yeah, let me do tokenization. We aren't too behind. Let's get through maybe Senate's tokenization. I'll give you some extra couple minutes at the end. Um, yeah, okay. So, what is tokenization? Well, tokenization is where I'm breaking things down into constituents. So we're taking the string, and you're going to see this word a lot, constituents, just like political constituents. They're a member of um, a county or group or, or state, whatever. Words are constituents of sentences. Sentences are constituents of paragraphs, etc. And that really means breaking them down. So when people say tokenization, they mostly, 99% of the time, mean words. But I can think break things down into sentences or paragraphs or pages, whatever. Okay, so tokenization as a concept is breaking bigger pieces into smaller pieces. Um, and I can pick the level of breaking it down. Okay. Generally, we've described the word token as an individual unit of meaning or a word, and a unique token being a type. We talked about how you can make type to tokens ratios, right? Lexical diversity. So how many unique words are they using? Um, but here we can also do sentences. So let's start with sentences. Sometimes people call sentence tokenization sentence segmentation because um, that has some alliteration in it. It's much funner to say. Sentence segmentation. It just sounds fancy, right? Um, and the basic technique in sentence segmentation is to say, well, where is a question mark, where is a period, where is an exclamation point, where is a new line character? Easy enough. And the library that one can do this with in R is called tokenizers. A tokenizers library often gets installed with something else. So the TM package is a very popular package for text manipulation. Um, I know there's a couple more. Um, and tokenizers like goes along for the ride, just like the stop words package in R is kind of along for the ride, and a lot of a lot of things call that, if you will. So I like tokenizers a lot because the function is very easy. It's tokenized sentences, okay, on our clean text here. Remember, clean text is one giant piece that we downloaded from um, the internet, and we kind of cleaned up a little bit. And then I told it just to print part of it. Because unfortunately, clean text puts it in this weird list format. So I told it to print the third through eighth sentence in the list. And you'll notice that it, all that JSON, because it doesn't have a period, just kind of got stuck together. It goes on forever. Where does it end? So in this guide, I'll go over how you can use web scraping from RBS and Selenium for Google Translate. So all that JSON at the beginning is stuck now in the front of sentence one. Now these sentences make a lot more sense. Note, I encourage responsible web scraping, because I do. I always try to do, to space things out so that I don't get IP blocked, <laughs> okay? And then um, it's got some weird stuff going on here, and it repeats itself. Why is it repeating itself? Well, part of my, apparently part of the description in the metadata that's in the background is the first, like, so many characters. So this little description is the first part of the blog so that it renders correctly in Google searches. So <laughs> now we've kind of got them twice, so I'd have to kind of sort that out. So if I told it to count the number of sentences, how many sentences are in that blog? I can show you what that blog looks like. Oh, wait. Our best. My own name here should come up from the front. So that metadata in the background, this is why it's printing twice. Let's go back. Does this have 466 sentences? Um, that's unlikely. That's a lot of sentences. I'm not that verbose. What's going on here? More than likely what's going on is the fact that it treats each of these new lines as a sentence. So each one of these pieces of code is a different sentence. Each one of these bullet points sentence. So there's probably no way that this short of a blog post is 466 sentences, right? I don't write blog. I write science papers that long, but not blogs. Now I could instead say, you know what? 
this whole thing is a weird list. Let's unlist it, see how long that is. Now it says there's only 33 sentences. Hmm. That probably more likely. Okay. So the way that it returns your object, if you will, and the way that count sentences works and the tokenization thing works, I don't trust ever trust count sentences. Okay. It is not a good function. So instead, what I will do if I'm trying to figure out how many sentences there are is do this tokenization on sentences. In R, you have to unlist that bad boy and then just count them. Let's look at that for Python. Okay. NLTK, oh, hold on, let me see. Question, question. Unlist. Yeah. So in R, when we build things um, that are lists, let me just run the code here. That'll help. Oh my god, uh, it prints everything. I'll run all this. And then, where did it go? Where did it go? Here. So let's save tokenized sentences here. Okay. So this is list format in R. Okay. And so lists can have multiple vectors in them. Okay. Unlist just undoes it. Creates it into one giant vector that you might see as like a column of data. Uh, I find unlist handy um, because many of these functions that we're talking about this semester, in R anyway, create these lists for a reason. The reason it... Um, Sorry, I've been having problems with Office 365 today. Um, the reason it creates a list is if you put in multiple, let's say you're trying to count the number of sentences across 200 documents, what will happen is you'll have one thing that's like document one, document two, document three. And so you can unlist to then see, you know, kind of all of them in one big character set. Um, so that's why I unlisted it. Now let's do this part in Python and then that's where we'll stop. So uh, in LTK, which we'll use off and on all semester, is uh, the Natural Language Toolkit. It's a really great package that they just don't really maintain anymore. Spacey is a new one that we'll use um, as well. And uh, I love NLTK for its tokenization functions and it, it has a lot of built-in stuff that's just useful. So we'll see it. And the default tokenizer is called the punct sentence tokenizer. Uh, there are a couple of them. That's the default in R as well. And that's a pre-trained model that finds these like sentence boundaries. So somebody sat down like machine learning style and trained this thing with regular expressions and some rules on where sentences should end. Okay. Um, and this works particularly well for like English and then European languages. So we would import NLTK, then the function is NLTK dot sentence tokenize, and you're just putting in clean text. That returns a list of objects. So um, here we've got sentences one through three, one up to three, but not including three, remember? So it's going to have to return two of them. And it says that we have 39 sentences. So we're getting pretty similar answers here between R and Python. We got 33 versus 39, but I mean, pretty close. Okay. So they are breaking these things a little bit differently. Um, and part of that might be some of our JSON as well. So where we'll start next time, can, um, wait, just kidding. Where we'll finish tonight and then start next time is um, a little bit on sentence tokenization here. So. The general rule is that you can use regular expressions. So in everything we're going to do, you can find these functions that probably do it for you, but that are built on regular expressions. So, so much of our work is, is a set of functions that someone wrote a very complex set of regular expressions for. So I only really recommend moving away from the predefined functions if you have a very specific problem. Okay. So here, what I would do first is find the end of the JSON. JSON is a specific format that I can that I know where it starts and stops. It's got curly brackets. It's a good cue. Okay. 
So what I would do is find the start curly bracket, find the final curly bracket, and slice all that out first. Okay. You don't have to do that for your assignment, but if I had real data with JSON code in it, I would like cut it all out that way first. Then I would use my default functions. So I always like to complement with regular expressions right, because there are some really great functions that do this stuff for me. I don't need to reinvent the wheel and sentence tokenization. Someone has thought about that a lot more than I have. Um, so I could then also supplement text that's been pre-processed already where I don't have to do anything to it with a regular tokenizer. So um, tokenization often goes last. Okay, it also just depends on what we're doing. There are some of these functions that require that you spit at words one at a time, and some of these functions allow you to give you a whole big string of text. Um, it's a little bit unpredictable. So I talk about sentence tokenization here and word tokenization next time up front because there are some of our functions in a little bit where we'll have to use this code. Okay. Um, but not always. So I only recommend the regular expression approach sort of if you have to. <laughs> but where we'll start next time is word tokenization, which is going to be more useful for our purposes. Um, then we'll talk about the other cleaning up points, which includes removing weird symbols, contractions, repeating characters, spelling, stimming, limitizing, stop words, and then tying it all together.